everybody. You are in for a treat today. I know I've said that before, but I'm here with um, Dr. Gordon from Gordon Medical Associates, and it is just an honor and a treat to have him today. We're going to talk about the cell danger response, and if you don't know what that means or have never heard of it, it's uh, I promise you it's very groundbreaking, and we're going to do our best to talk not only, you know me, we always talk on a pretty high level, but we'll actually try to make it very practical and understandable. Um, I'll be watching out of the corner of my eye the chat box. So if you do have questions, I'll do my best to, if we can't get to them in real time, I will come back and watch those. Um, a few housekeeping things. Um, you can find all my blogs and information, all free resources on my website, which is just my name, jillcarnahan.com. And any products, um, I try not to mention a ton of products because these are really non-commercial, but if we do, they're at drjillhealth.com. Uh, but we're just here to bring you great information. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, so this will go live to the YouTube channel in a few days. And you can just search my name on YouTube and you'll see 50 plus interviews with great medical experts like Dr. Gordon. They're all free. You can watch them at your leisure. If you're catching us later, mid, um, you know, mid interview, you can come back and watch this on Facebook as well. So I want to introduce Dr. Gordon first, and then we will dive right in. And I will ask him to um, tell us a little bit about the, the story of the cell danger response in his story. So Dr. Eric Gordon is the president of Gordon Medical Research Center and the founder and owner of Gordon Medical Associates. He's in the San Francisco Bay Area specializing in complex chronic illness. In addition to clinical practice over 40 years, he's engaged in clinical research. I love that we have clinicians like him that are brilliant in their treatment of patients, but also doing the research because as we talked about just before getting on here, things are constantly in flux. And one of the things we have to be comfortable with is the uncertainty of change and not always having the answers, even though we like to have the best data at our disposal. And part of that comes from great research like with clinicians like himself. So I just shout out to him for doing that. In 20, uh, 2007 to 2009, he created a series of medical symposium, bringing together leading international medical researchers and cutting edge clinicians to focus on chronic fatigue, Lyme disease, autoimmune, autism, a lot of these things we see in clinical practice. Combining the forces with Dr. Navu and his researchers into metabolomics, mitochondrial function, and chronic inflammatory disease is now bringing this dream to life. In 2016, he co-authored a paper with Dr. Navu on the groundbreaking study, Metabolic Features of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. And um, we're going to talk, we're going to dive into that and talk about that. So first of all, welcome, Dr. Gordon. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Jill. It's a pleasure to be here, it really is. Um, and especially the work that you do, because you, know, you mentioned those Ratna Ling meetings we had. Mm -hmm. And if I had you with me then, they wouldn't have been kept a secret. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, we all need each other, right? I'm like, love talking. And then, but you're back there doing no, the no, work. No. Like I have such admiration for that because that is just, uh, my research is not my gift, but I'm so grateful to people like you that are doing the work to bring the information out. What I want to start with was what I start with every person I talk to is your story. How did you get into medicine? Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into this. And then we'll talk about how you got into the cell danger response work. Okay, well, I don't want to talk too much about me, but, uh, you know, I just started out, I, I was always interested in science and, and psychology, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, the great, the great questions, and medicine just seemed like a natural place to go, and, um, you know, I had, when I entered medical school, I was a little older than most already, and uh, I had taken more than a, a year off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was the 60s, so we didn't go to school often. Um, but when I entered, I, I already planned to do what uh, we now call functional integrative medicine. Back then, we called alternative medicine. Yeah. Um, but after when I got into medical school, I was just so overwhelmed by the magic of medicine, of acute care medicine. It's so that I couldn't, I began to doubt that what I was reading about how you could treat people with natural things, how, you know, how could that possibly work? Yeah. You know, it seemed like, oh my God, you know, this, the magic I was doing was too big for a supplement to possibly help. So I kind of did regular medicine for about 12 years, but I was always still dabbling. I studied, I went to, in those days, um, there were small meetings, you know, we get together with Leo Galland and the Bach brothers and, um, you know, Jeff Bland came to visit, you know, but I was like watching from the outside. And then in 92, I made the leap and I studied a year of osteopathy and I just went into this. And, you know, the thing that drove me was I believed my patients 
Yeah. And when you see, and the thing in, in regular medicine, what I call regular medicine, yeah. is what, uh, what afflicts our patients is that doctors, if, you, if they don't have a diagnosis, yeah. they don't believe you right. often. Not always, I mean, to be fair. Um, but it, if you frustrate them too long with too many complaints, um, they tend to, you know, tell you that you're depressed or depressed anxious or hypochondriac or yeah. the old term yeah. functional. Now, remember when functional didn't mean the functional that we know and functional meant, we don't know why you have the symptoms you do, but we're just going to call it functional because that's all that we know to do. Right. <laughs> because, you know, it's obviously a dysfunction of yeah. your organ, but you're not broken and right. broken is what we understand. Conventional medicine is brilliant at broken. Yes. You know, um, as I always tell people, a bullet wound, a car accident, a heart attack. Yeah, we got you covered. Um, a sprained ankle. We don't do so well. Right. You know, anything that doesn't break completely. We don't understand healing. That's a you great know? way to put it, because it really yeah. does. It's a whole different paradigm. And there is a place for conventional, excellent yeah. Western medicine. We both use that as a foundation. And then it's like I think of our toolboxes are just a lot bigger. We have more options. And most conventional medicines uh, taught to get a code and a diagnosis and then th that it ends. You've done your job. Whereas you and I, we say, why? Why did this happen? Let's go deeper and dig. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the story. I mean, this is what, you know, uh, one of Dr. Navi, not as actually it's Dr. Navio. I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a little French pronunciation. Thank there. you for, pro yeah. I knew I was pronouncing uh, Navio. Thank you yeah, for helping. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Potato, potato, but he might, um, the, you know, he's, he's, um, you know, he's been trying to, um, show us that, that we, we need to use the, abil the, the massive abilities we have to study disease um, using science, because he is for, he's a, an MD, but he's foremost really uh, a researcher. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a clinician for many years. He was a specialist in inborn errors of metabolism, uh, yeah. diseases that affect usually kids that um, often will you know, lead, lead to death before the age 10. These are like one, two or three gene uh, anomalies, you know, uh, mutations that, that cause, you know, severe disease. Um, and, um, but as he cha channeled, as he chased those things, he got more and more into the complexity of things, found that genetics was an unsatisfactory satisfactory answer, because even at the level of one gene being um, uh, in error, well, the two patients with that same genetic defect had very different outcomes. Differently. Okay, I mean, it's one child would pass away at two and the other one could live to eight. So it, was, it wasn't just that gene, it was the, the whole system. Yeah. And so as he studied more and more sy systems approach, I sort of went right off into Dr. Navio, okay. <laughs> no, I would like to know, and before we dive into the research yeah. on cell yeah. danger, how did you meet? How did you connect with the cell danger? Tell me about the oh, story. Okay. Of well, you know, in 2000, and I can remember the dates because they were that momentous and, and, and for moving me in life. In 2013, um, Dr. Chandra, excellent um, psychiatrist and pediatrician and just all around great practitioner in the South Bay, sent me an article his article, Oxidative Shielding yes. um, or, or Oxidative Stress. And, you know, I sent it out in my clinic. We, at that time, uh, Neil Nathan was working with me, Wayne Anderson, um, and I sent it out to everybody. And Neil came back to me and said, we've got to meet this man. You know, because this was, I thought this was the best article on biochemistry that explained things. Because what, because what, what was happening at this time is, in the 90s, I was treating people like many functional doctors do today with, you know, you balance the hormones, you clean up the gut, you know, you remove the obvious infections and, you know, people got better. It was really cool. Um, but when I moved to California in 98, I inherited a lot of patients of uh, a brown, groundbreaking doctor, Dr. Jeff Anderson, who's retired now. Um, and he had a lot of people who'd been sick for 20, 30 years. And they would come in, many of them over the years, with shopping bags of supplements, but they didn't help. And I started, and again, Wayne joined me in 2001, and we started seeing a lot of Lyme patients. Yes. Um, and, you know, the supplements weren't, I mean, I said in the, the 90s, the supplements were great, and now they weren't working. So, and I never quite understood, you know, because the model is, you know, chronic inflammation, reactive oxygen species, right? You know, antioxidants should help, but right. they did you know? And Dr. Navio's paper just kind of like opened my eyes and went, 
God. This is why, is that the system is stuck in loops, okay? Right. That this oxidative stress that we talked about was really the body's first response to infection, yes. to self-protection. We created that oxidative stress in order to kill the bugs and signal to our other cells that there's danger here. You know, it wasn't that it was um, a bad thing. The right. bad thing was we couldn't turn it off. Yes. And that is where we get into what makes um, the con our, our, our functional medicine conceptions brought to life because we're always talking about how we can rebalance the body. Okay. But it, it's, it, we still often go at it and, and I myself do it all the time with that um, basic first, first book of medicine concept of find out the underlying pathology. You know, what is, what, what is wrong with the, with the, with the system? Okay. And that's a very let's useful define, thing. When you say, cause first and second book of medicine and Dr. Navio's work, let's just tell me oh, more. Oh, yes. That. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm gonna, it's, you know, I've been thinking about this now for Perfect. seven years. So it's yeah. kind of like, <laughs> lives, I apologize. so um, he, what he called the first book of medicine is basically what, I, what we were trained with in yeah. medical school. Okay. You know, you have a problem, you make a diagnosis, mm -hmm. you find, you have a disease, you find out the proximate cause of that disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you have pneumonia, you want to find out what bug caused yeah. that pneumonia. Got it. Straight, I mean, it's straightforward, but basically 70% of the NIH budget to yes. this day is stuck on finding out the cause of disease. And that works really well when the disease is an acute disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you were, you were relatively okay. Something happens. You're sick the next day. Normally you go through a cycle and you're better within six weeks. I mean, generally that that's why we get away with lousy medicine because yeah. people we do get better within six weeks. Right, they get better with or without us sometimes. Right? <laughs> exactly. You know, that, that, that is the dirty secret of medicine is that 90% of people are better yeah. without. Um, but in chronic illness, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. In chronic illness, and that's where the second book of medicine yes. comes in. Because yes. the first book of medicine basically has an intervention, okay, which is, let's say, an antibiotic or um, sometimes just something to, you stop the bleed. Right. I mean, that's a very good example. You know, you stop the bleeding. And then we depend on what um, I, many people, I think, but I like, I think of Bob calling it the black box of healing. Yes. Yeah, okay. I love it. Yeah, Bob yeah. Roundtree, our king of functional medicine. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. It, it, I mean, many people are probably yeah. going that term, but it's like, you know, that's what we depend on, yeah. you know, and we haven't spent enough time looking at what is allowing the healing mechanism. We've spent too much time looking at what is broken yes. as though all we have to do is replace one part. Right. Okay. And so the second book of medicine is really what um, the naturopaths and those of us who are in now functional integrative medicine try to practice is looking at the system. Yes. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's easier said than done because we don't really understand the system very well. <laughs> it's incredibly and complex. Level, if, I, if I would I just add what I find is the level come when we go to medicine, if we just have a diagnosis and treatment, it's very, very simple and straightforward. There's still thousands and hundreds of thousands of different diagnoses, but it's a very straightforward uh, line, linear A to B process, right? We're going into uh, much more, um, the points are so diverse. I always think of like quantum quantum versus Newtonian physics, right? We're going into this where the variables are so many and the systems are so complex that we're never dealing with one thing. We're dealing with a hundred of thousands of things at, at one time. Which is why, um, I mean, you, you bring up a, a really important point that I, that I know patients, one of the things that patients get very upset at and I respect it is yeah. um, the unfortunate cost of what we do. Yes. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to them because it, it, it's, it's real. It's terrible. But, you know, in con conventional medicine now is based on the what, seven to 10 minute visit. Yeah. You know, and if you come in there and try to talk about more than one thing that's right. bothering you, you're out. And right. we're dealing with we're dealing with it. I mean, forget about even thinking in the systems approach. Right. Our patients have systems have. Um, systemic dysfunctions. I mean, and, and again, in, in regular, in the old days, in the emergency room, we used to call it, you know, the, um, the, the, 
positive review of systems. Yeah. You know, yeah. basically you ask right. people about their eyes, ears, well, now nose. Now we call it love. multi-symptom, multi-system illness, which is Lyme and mold and everything related to the cell danger response. It means every system in your body has symptoms and it doesn't make sense. There's no, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but, but, but the, the point you were making before is that this happens because there are so many things at play. So we have all of our systems and then we have all the minor or major dysfunctions that depend on you know your genetics and your environmental exposures. And that makes this disease a disease of the individual, which you can't wrap up in 15 minutes. Right, Because right. you, 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 you haven't, yeah, you've barely scratched the surface. And there's no protocol or one size fits all here, right? I have so resisted protocolized medicine because every single patient, it needs an individual plan and treatment. And I know you agree with that. Oh, you know, we have been over the, I mean, I've had a clinic here in California for 22 years now, and I have been approached multiple times to try to um, monetize it, you know, yeah. to, and, and we, I mean, and people come in and they live, they run away because they see that we don't make money because when you're doing things individually, even the the medical assistants have such a hard job because they don't know that to, that you're going to do A, B, C. Absolutely, Eric. I couldn't agree more. And a lot of colleagues, no disrespect for them. They have a A, B, C plan to detox in 20 days. That doesn't work for our population. It There's works no... for healthy people. Yes, I mean, exactly. That, 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 that was my point from the beginning. The functional medicine approach, as most people are taught, is an amazing thing for folks who are imbalanced a little bit. They yes. haven't slept too much. They just had a divorce. They're working two jobs. You know, like they're stressed. Yeah, right, we can right. turn we can them around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, With but, the protocol, we, probably. <laughs> yeah, usually because you don't, the, you know, I was a mechanic for a very short time. And what I liked about working on people after that was in people, we just had to get close. Yeah. Okay. People heal, you know, cars don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And um, again, it's that black box of healing because that's the magic of life. There are so many different ways. Um, I, I always said I want to put a sign up of my clinic. Everything works sometimes. Yeah. Because I, I swear, I mean, I've almost never met a therapy that's out there on the internet that doesn't work sometimes. for some yeah. people. Yeah, totally. You know, it's well, let's just, talk about small <laughs> response and like, what is this thing? People are like, I mean, you and I know what it is, but how would, how would you describe that in lay terms and okay. why is it so relevant to? Uh, okay, cell danger response. Well, it, it's basically, um, you know, when we start looking at healing, you know, and, and the body's response, I said, we had that first step where we see a lot of reactive oxygen species. Yeah. You know, and so what um, Dr. Navio did was just give us a conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're saying that normally there's you know health, there's you know sleep and wake cycles, and there's the minor stresses of life. You know, you exercise. Exercise is a great example. Yeah. When you really exercise hard, you really are um, stressing. You, you're 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 killing some cells. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, if you take a lot of vitamin C and a lot of antioxidants before you exercise, you won't get as much of a training response because you're not stressing your cells enough. You know, you want to stress them. And that's going through this healing cycle where some cells die. Okay. That's CDR. And that, that would be like the CDR one. CDR two is when the cells start to rebuild and replace those that um, have been, have been lost. CDR three is when those repl replacement cells are finished um, restoring full communication. Because when the cell is being like either a new cell or an old cell that's gone through some real big stresses, um, it shuts down. The cell membrane, okay, very good example in CDR1, the cell membrane um, kind of thickens. It becomes less permeable, okay, to outside influences. Mm -hmm. And as you go to the CDR2, it becomes a little bit more in CDR3. You, all those little channels begin to open up and work normally. And you begin to all the receptors for your hormones um, and the other neuropeptides and things began to work more normally. And then you back in communication. So you're kind of, the, the cell danger response is that time when your cells are really kind of offline from the whole. Now this happens obviously, usually just in small parts. I mean, I think that's what, what people miss. Share. I want you to keep going, but I want to actually share. This is from your website, um, just so people can see this for just a moment. Can you see that? 
Yes. Uh, because then yeah. people can see what you're talking about. And I'll just leave this up just for a minute while you're talking. This is from your website, gordonmedical.com. Well, and well, this, is, right. I say, this is Dr. Navio's slide. Because yes, you know, yes. one thing I want to make always is clear <laughs> is that, um, you know, what, what clin there are some clinicians, I mean, to be fair, like Dr. Like Richie Shoemaker, Dr. Shoemaker, okay, who are really um, research clinicians. Mm -hmm. Okay. I am a clinician. I treat the person in front of me. What I, how I help researchers Yes. Occasionally with an idea or two, but mo but mostly by supplying patients, you know, and really defining who they are, because that's one of the big problems with the research in our field mm -hmm. is that the patient selection for a lot of these studies is very poor, especially in the chronic fatigue world. Okay, so that being said, um, so this is Dr. Navio's work. Um, you know, I always said, you know, his brain, my 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 brawn. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and as you can see. Oops. <laughs> well, I just made it a little bigger there for you. <laughs> Uh, okay. Now I'm sorry, we're on the well, that, that's okay. But um, so you can see is that he's and, and this is a newer slide because when he first started off, he was just calling it the cell danger response. Mm -hmm. And then he, he really wanted to, you know, open and go get away from this pathology based response. Okay. And try to show that, wait a minute, this is the healthy life cycle. It only becomes um, the healing and aging cycle when we get stuck mm -hmm. in one of these pathways, okay? And that's where we get into chronic illness is that when, um, and most of the chronic illnesses that we deal with are, um, by the, are predominantly in that CDR3 range. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are plenty that we deal with that are in the CDR2, um, you know, as far as, you know, heart disease and diabetes and things like that. But the, um, you know, the, the chronic, um, the Lyme and things of that sort are really, you know, more CDR3, um, you know, the mast cell disorder, I guess, more like CDR1 probably, but it, it's, it, it's all a question of um, restoring communication. And each yeah. one of these, e each one of these steps, steps in the cycle, um, your mitochondria, and I think this is, I'm just gonna be brief about this part because I don't get too technical. But um, the other amazing thing um, is that we were always taught that the mitochondria were basically the powerhouse of the cell. They made energy. Mm -hmm. That's what they did, you know, when you're mitochondria. And we were taught that in the diseases that we treat that had a lot of fatigue, the mitochondria were, were broken. Yeah. I mean, not that they were dysfunctional, but we really thought that they were like poisoned and broken. Right. And sometimes they are poisoned. That is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but usually they're not broken. Most of the time they are deciding the, 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 the mitochondria actually is the, is the organelle that senses danger, yeah. okay? And then programs the nucleus to respond and to change, to, to start putting out the chemicals that um, tell, tell, the, tell the cell what to do next to respond to danger. So the simplest thing is the mitochondria, when you have like a virus, the virus will be using up your own um, uh, nutrients basically. Okay. And so the vital, when the mitochondria sees that it kind of browns out. Yes. Okay. It, it acts like I always compare it to the old days, the feudal castle, you know, when the van, you know, like when the, um, when, when the marauders were coming, you like locked the castle and you burnt the fields. So you deprive them of, you know, they, they couldn't stay, they couldn't lay siege for a long time because they had no supplies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, your cells work the same way. Okay, even a single cell organism. When a virus enters, your mitochondria stop making ATP like they used to, at least they lower it very, very much. And when, when you stop making ATP, you don't use oxygen. Mitochondria are the part of this organ or are the, the organelle in your cell that is like a sink. It uses up the oxygen. So when you stop doing that, the oxygen concentration in the, what we call the cytoplasm, the gunk that's in the cell, okay, goes up and that creates oxidative stress. Yes. But that happens not because the bug did it. It's because your body is doing that yes. to create a bad environment for the bug. Right. The infection. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then when all goes well, okay, mm -hmm. then um, so the first thing it does is some of your ATP gets transported to the cell membrane and it acts as a signaling molecule. And that's the other thing that was really important that he taught us that ATP and other things called purines um, signal danger to the body. Mm -hmm. And the same signal can be 
you're gonna, you're really sick, or it can be as mild as what makes you remember better. Because it's like, if when you're, when you, you know, we see so many things, we remember stuff that's dangerous. Right. right. Okay. And we do that because the ATP on the cell goes up mm -hmm. and it helps get the dopamine yes. to work better. And we remember, mm -hmm. you know, so um, anyway, so ATP is a signaling molecule, not just an energy molecule. Right. The mitochondria is an energy producing, but also our immune quarterback. Yes. Okay. So, um, and you know, when in health, when things, when you're in a normal healthy cycle, the, you first start to make in, a lot of inflammatory chemicals, and then your body starts to create lots of anti-inflammatory chemicals. Okay. I mean, that's why a lot of the herbs work. A lot of the herbs that we use are actually pro-oxidants. Yeah. They're it's going the same in reason and why PRP works or some of these um, pro uh, pro uh, prolotherapy where you inject yeah. joint inflammatory molecules so that you get a response to the site for healing, right? Exactly. We're turning on the healing response. The, when we get into trouble is when because of a toxin or mm -hmm. because of something an earlier infection has done yeah. to us, we're not able to turn that healing cycle. We're not able to get to the next step yeah. of the healing yes. cycle. We get the bottom stuck. line is it gets stuck, right? It gets yeah. stuck in one of those. Now let's talk just a little bit about um, CD, uh, CDR1, CDR2, CDR3. They kind of have different, like if someone gets stuck in one versus two or three, they may manifest. And you might want to also talk about, like we talked about Lyme and um, mold and these chronic things that you and I see all the time. Why is that so relevant for those particular patients? Why is this topic? Well, because it, it helps it helps us understand that um, you know because sometimes you get frustrated when you're trying to put out the fire, yeah. okay, and you have to realize that in order to put out the fire, we have to change the milieu. We we have to change the information, mm -hmm. not just give the raw materials, okay? You know, like so when someone's fatigued, you know, many or we think their mitochondria aren't working well. You know, well, many times people want to give now, you know, NADs, the new flavor of the month, but NAD, CoQ10, you know, the PQQs, all these things that are good for your mitochondria, you know. But when you're really stuck in CDR1, yes, you can give all you want. It's and not sometimes, good. would you say it could make it worse? I don't know for sure, but I have a theory that it's possible if you're pushing production of ATP, is that theoretically possible that you could actually fan the flames or it not necessarily? could, but I, the, the thing is, is that you, since the block is usually yeah. before that, it's Got not, it. much, but one interesting thing about ATP, just a pearl, this is for the patients and the clinicians, because I, you know, one of that sense of air hunger, yes, many people describe, Okay, that we often think of as Babesia, because yeah, right. it often is associated with Babesia, um, but it can show up lots of ways. Um, there were some studies in the 90s, they were, they tried to use injectable ATP um, for the cachexia, for the weight loss of cancer, mm -hmm. you know, people, because they thought this would give them yeah. some strength and restore their, you know, it's the energy, you know, we're going right. to give them energy. And one of the big side effects was air hunger. Okay. You see, because it's a danger signal, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, ATP is supposed to be in this, it, it, inside the cell, um, right. not outside, outside. The cell. That's the it, thing, right? The core here is ATP in the cell. Beautiful. ATP outside the cell, the body's like, whoa, there's something not supposed to be, there's something not right here. That's a big key principle, isn't it? Yeah. Wrong location. <laughs> Wrong lo yeah. And, 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 and that, that's why we, we struggle. I'm, I'm I'm going to do a little quick divot to the right. I'll, I'll be real fast. But sure. why we struggle with a lot of the functional tests that we do, because I love them. We all do them. But, you know, when you're measuring um, bio, you know, biochemicals, when you're measuring succinate, mm -hmm. you know, take a yeah. chemical, you know, but it's involved in a thousand different reactions right. in the body. You know, and so we assume that when we're measuring succinate, we're doing it because it's in the Krebs cycle, but yeah, you know. Right, it might be, it's a, totally agree. You really, <laughs> I always say that little random, I mean, this is another random side note too, but that's, that's all good. Like urinary mycotoxins can indicate mold, can indicate you're excreting them, which might be good, right? So you have to think about the context of the testing and make a decision based on that. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, it, it, this is what I, I'm still struggling with, 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 with this issue. Cause I mean, see when it comes to mercury, I know, cause I've been doing mercury since 92 and I have enough, I'm positive I know what I'm doing, which might be right. arrogant and maybe I'm wrong, but, <laughs> but I've seen so many people with super high, you know, provoked mercury levels, but you just stop their fish. They're just really, really good at getting rid of it. 
exactly. you know, they're healthy. You exactly. know, it's the ones whose mercury levels never get above eleven. Mm-hmm who are often chronically ill, yes. you know, because they can't mobilize, right. they're not able to do it. And, and you know, you're right. And this is, this has always been the question. And hopefully ICI, I mean, I just doing, I mean, I have a little, hopefully a little something to do with that. I kept prodding yeah. um, because I want to know that answer. Cause yeah. I mean, you know, this goes way we back. Did, back. Because now we're doing research. We collected the money. I helped yeah. contribute then we're going to do the research over. It's going to be wonderful. Cause this is something that I said, yeah. I've argued with many doctors about for years. Cause I'm, yeah. Um, but, I couldn't you know, agree more with you. Yeah. Again, I would say it's a simple way to describe this is mobilization and excretion. We can mobilize really well, but if we're not excreting, we get stuck, It get the, people get more toxic. So these concepts are so critical, right? Yeah, and, and we, we just, and you know, this is why um, research in our field is so important. And like, I'm so proud that ICI yeah. is taking that step because I've been, I've always been upset that that the the functional labs that we use um, yeah. haven't stood up over the last. I mean, because I've been using right. some of these labs literally for thirty five. Right. I, mean, I I was doing Genova when it was the little it was the guys in New Jersey. You know, yes. I mean, it's like Smoky, great Smoky. Uh, oh, so great Smokies, <laughs> but no, when he when he started it, he was in New Jersey <laughs> in the in the early eighties. You know, then he moved to Asheville. But it's just like you know, they've made so much money. We should be, they should be helping us. They should be leading the edge of research. I totally agree. Because we would use it, I mean, yeah, anyways. Okay, it's a frustration because they help us. They definitely guide our therapy, but we're all looking for the CBC of functional medicine. Okay, and that just getting back to our topic, the metab- the meta- metabolomics and yes. Dr. Navio's work, how I got really carried away was I was hoping that with that we were going to be able to use metabolomics to yes. define right. and help me tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> okay, that was that's that's been my prayer since I've got into this field is that I'm going to get a test that's going to be an A B C. Right. <laughs> You know, I would like that, you know, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and we, we have things that are a, and maybe B. Um, yeah. So the metabolomics. Okay. And, and where this comes in is that what, to, what gets you from cell danger from CDR one yeah. to CDR two to CDR three are fluxes in metabolites. Okay. See, and this is the other big Mm-hmm. piece is that we've always thought of the body is the communication network is you know hormones yeah and now we've accepted cytokines you know the inflammatory chemicals that the white blood cells make and other cells make and um you know neurotransmitters but what turns on and turns off genes and what a lot of the information in the system is is the simple metabolites yeah. not just atp right. but succinate fumarate, acetyl-CoA, um, you know, just oxygen levels, um, you know, the, the raw materials of metabolism, okay, also control what genes are expressed, yes. okay? Because remember, you know, people talk about gene, about epigenetics. Well, that's because there's changes in these things called histones right. that decide where, what, what part of the DNA gets expressed because mm-hmm. we only express little bits. Mm-hmm. And when you're sick, okay, and you don't methylate, all of a sudden you start expressing more places. It's almost like opening Pandora's box. Yeah, yeah. You know, when your body's really in trouble. You start throwing out lots of ideas. You know, you make chemi- you, you actually do that. You actually, I mean, that's why we wind up with sometimes retroviral particles coming out because we got a ton of retroviral DNA and we don't really understand why it's there. Sometimes it's useful. Sometimes it gets us sick, but anyway, so um, the metabolites really are controlling the show. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, the, the, um, the lipids, things like we call them ceramides and sphingolipids. And these are names that, to be honest, I had vague idea about before I learned about this. I mean, they're, they're just, they're long chain fatty acids. Um, they're a little bit, they're organized a little differently and they are big communication molecules, but they're still small, relatively. Enzymes have thousands and hundreds of thousands of carbon atoms. These guys are all like having like, you know, 10, 20, 50, I mean, 50 is a lot, you know, it, 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 you know, they're small, relatively small molecules, but these are what determine our state of health. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and we try to, and when you're healthy, you can make big changes just by putting in the right nutrients yeah. and trying to feed these things. But when you're sick, yeah. your body is using these as signaling molecules that keep you, that can keep yeah. you stuck. Keep you stuck. So yeah. let's go. So cell danger response is so important. I feel like you've really done a great job of explaining that. We kind of gave a little visual as I went through my computer. <laughs> Um, and, um, but the, what's the practical application of a patient, um, with Lyme or mold or toxicity, how would you approach them and how would the cell danger response practically change our treatment? That's the well, treatment you know, part, right? okay, to, to be honest at this point, not as much as I would like. Me too. Okay? I agree. Yeah. That's why well, I asked let, that. Let me, let me just like, it out. Is it, cause you see what happened is, is that we did that study in 2000, it was, we actually did it in 14 and was published in 16 and we've been working on it since. And what we were trying to do was establish what, where the imbalance was in the system. Right. Okay. And one, we were, which part a, a group of chemicals and for, for chronic fatigue, we could get um, a, a pretty good idea, but it still didn't give us a, yeah. A, 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 what we were looking for, which is a way in, we're still looking at like, how do we rebalance the system? So, but when it comes to Lyme, I think the important part of the cell danger response is the thinking process. I, just, I mean, it just, it just gets you to go back and realize that what we have with almost any chronic infection mm -hmm. is a failure to communicate. Yes. You know, um, the, and, 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 you know, whether you wind up with mast cell mm -hmm. disorder on top of that, right. or um, just neuropathic pain, mm -hmm. okay, can just depend on where your genetic weakness is, yeah. What, yeah. what your weak link is, or what other exposures you have. And, um, you know, where I find the cell danger response helpful is that it keeps bringing me back to um, think about the milieu. Yeah. You know, um, think about, is there another piece that can be balanced? Because yeah. when we realize that, um, you know, when, when you have um, the cell danger response, it's not a thing in itself. It's just part of the body's process. And you can have cells in your liver that are stuck in CDR1 and you can wind up with chronic hepatitis. Right. You know, but it's only a small pocket. It's not right. your whole liver often, you know, I mean, or you can have uh, um, some that are stuck in CDR3 mm -hmm. and more likely those are going to help keep you toxic. Yeah. Okay. Because you're not going to be communicating well, and those are going to be offline and not able to be dealing when they, when they, when they start um, absorbing things, they're not going to be able to process them well mm -hmm. and communicate to those around them. So, um, you know, the, the CDR3 is, I mean, the CDR system is more at this point, a way of thinking and, and also getting us out of the habit of thinking that we're going to kill the bug yeah. and fix the problem. Okay. okay. I love that you're saying that because I couldn't agree more. Like this is a foundational, it's almost like the, the earth was flat and now it's round. <laughs> it's that kind of a paradigm shift in our field of understanding of what mechanisms are causing. And so those of your patients are listening and it's like, well, what's the pill? There's no pill. There's no one size fits all just like we started. But um, I don't want you to lose hope or feel like we're just talking way up here on an esoteric level, oh. because this is really critical. I agree with you, Dr. Gordon, when I understood this and heard this a couple of years ago, it was game changing in how I think about the patients. And that matters to you because Dr. Gordon and I, when we sit in front of you, we have a different paradigm that helps us better to understand, even if we don't have every single last answer yet, we're moving in that direction. And I feel like it's, I kind of just wanted to frame it because I agree with you. It's not like it gives us one pill for an ill, but it does frame things so importantly in a different way. Would yeah. you agree? It, it gives, yes. And it, I mean, this is, again, it's the frustrating thing for the patients because to be honest, we were, we were going to try to, um, you know, semi-commercialize for research so we could do yeah. more research, the metabolomic test for chronic fatigue in the beginning. Yeah. And the reason we didn't do it is because it was going to cost $1,500 to the patient. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I really wasn't going to be able to do anything that different for them. Yeah. And I knew the chronic fatigue world is full of patients who don't have much money yes. and for them to throw $1,500 away. And they were lining up to do it. It, it was, it, it, no, we couldn't do that. I would have loved to, because we would have gotten the data, yeah. but we would have hurt a lot of people because we I wouldn't love have that ethic. I could not agree more. Cause it's always like, is this test going to change your intervention? No, you always ask yeah. 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 It, it, it will in time. Yeah. But, yes. you know, I, I like to, 
you know, when, when we're in the, when we're training in conventional medicine, we unfortunately learn on people without resources yeah. in the ER. Okay. And okay. now um, the only good thing is that now we learn on people with resources yeah. <laughs> because we are learning because yeah. people can afford to do these tests that aren't perfect, but we keep learning and yeah. get better at we do because these people can afford it. Yes. You know, and we are again, I just feel even the last two years since I've seen the research, there's yeah. there continue to be ahas and you're continuing to do research. I'm continuing to spread the word. So Gosh, yeah. thank you so much for um, just expounding in a really um, uh, wonderful way about this. It's such a complex topic. If anyone's interested, I'm going to include the articles. I'll include link to Dr. Gordon's website and everything. Where can people, I mean, you've got your website. Where else can people find you? Are you taking patients? Tell us just a little bit about your practice. Yeah, I, I, I you know, we, we, I'm still taking patients. I prefer to take patients who have been ill for a long time and, and, and just need a, another look. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we, 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 the practice taking patients, um, you know, Dr. Parpia, who's on here um, is taking patients. And I mean, what she is, is amazing at is um, guiding people back to health. I'm, you know, what I'm really good at is figuring out what's wrong. Yeah. Okay. That's what I do very well. Oh, not wrong, but you're you know, a detective. Go. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. And right now I've got, um, you know, two young naturopaths working with me who are, do, who are doing some patient research on the side. So it's really, that's what I do. But when it comes to treatment, Dr. Mm -hmm. Parpia just it, it has the one, because I, my attention span is I'm, I'm, I, I'm a little too all over the place. And it's like, I can, when I see the beauty of her work, you know, because I always want to fix the thing in front of me. It's that yeah. regular doctor stuff. Totally. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and what happens is that you can keep treating with band aids, and which are great to get someone strong enough to begin to heal. Yeah. But that's why I love what um, Dr. Parpia does is that she gets people into the process. Yeah. of healing and doesn't get as distracted as I can by like, oh, oh here, try this. <laughs> we need all these types, right? Like, cause we need you to do the research and be thinking outside the box. And I just have, I want to publicly say I have the greatest gratitude. You are one of the pioneers in our field and I have great respect and gratitude for all that you've done and continue to do. And even just your heart comes across, you're genuine, you're humble. And you know, it's funny, there's not a lot of that left in our medical world. So thank you for coming on today. Thank you for sharing your heart and your research. And I will be sure in uh, link back everybody if you want to know more about Dr. Gordon the practice Dr. Parpia um, it's been a pleasure talking to you okay well thank you Jill you've been great you and uh, I said next time we'll, we'll we'll make a more linear story for you <laughs> it was perfect I think everybody followed take care and have a great rest of okay the day. you too pleasure <laughs>